Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton with Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's episode. Hey, I'm really excited about this conversation we're going to be having with a supply chain leader on the move with some new big ideas for industry. So uh, stay tuned. You're going to hear the passion for leadership in droves. A uh, quick programming note before we get started here. Hey, if you like what you hear today, make sure you go find Supply Chain Now wherever you get your podcast from and click subscribe so you don't miss a single thing like this interview right here. So let's tee up our guest here. Uh, it, I had to really cull this down from about 18 pages of accomplishments and leadership roles and positions. So our featured guest is a senior supply chain management student at Howard University. She also serves as president of the school's Supply Chain Management Student Association. Our guest has completed four successful internships with the world-renowned Cisco Systems Organization. She's also been recognized as a 2020 Young Futurist by The Root Magazine. She serves as president and CEO of her own nonprofit organization that she founded, Waves of Change HBCU, Inc. And if that doesn't keep her busy enough, in whatever free time she's got remaining, our guest enjoys volunteering and giving back especially at her local Salvation Army facility. Join me in welcoming Rachel Clark. Rachel, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Thank you so much for that introduction. Well, you bet. I had to, I had to uh, exercise just so I could get it all in there. Uh, I tell you, <laughs> I really uh, I admire, um, you know, deeds, not words is something we talk around uh, a lot about here at Supply Chain Now, and you've got that in, in spades, and I admire that already about you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So we're going to, we got the opportunity over the next uh, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, however long it takes us to dive into your story. And, and beyond that, hearing your take on, on industry, on supply chain, on a lot of different topics. So are you buckled up and ready to go? Yeah, never better. <laughs> hey, all right. So I like to ask, I like to start a conversation, you know, kind of just getting a better feel for Rachel Clark, the person, and one of those, one of those um, universal questions I think a lot of folks bond around is, is where are you from? Where'd you grow up? So, so fill in the gaps, that, uh, let us know where you grew up and you got to give us, uh, some anecdotes on your upbringing. So fill us <laughs> in. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a little bit about my back. I'm actually from a small town in Massachusetts. Uh, so on the South shore, uh, for context, pretty rural. My uncle's actually a cattle farmer. So if that gives you any context to kind of <laughs> the area that I'm from, um, it was very interesting. I think being from where I'm from, uh, so my mom's actually an immigrant from Haiti and my dad's of Irish American ancestry. And so growing up, having those experiences, being from a town where my dad's from this town, his dad's from this town, his dad's from his town. And Apparently his dad's from Ireland, but you know, uh, we'll see, you know, <laughs> gotta get on an ancestry to double check that, but that's as the legend goes. And so I have this legacy uh, from where I come from. And then on the flip side, my mom's side of the family, you know, she's new to the United States and seeing that perspective from the immigrant side of things versus a truly homegrown American, I think gave me a really, really unique experience. And then being from such a small town where, you know, it's not a huge population. A lot of people are also from that area. Uh, I think it taught me to get comfortable at an early age with standing out just from how I looked, how I spoke. Mm. And again, from my background and as a child, that's like terrifying, right? Like we, right. Been, like, we don't want that. But as an adult, as a young adult, you realize that that's actually like your superpower because the biggest thing that holds people back is they're afraid to stand out. They're afraid mm. to be successful. They're afraid that their friends are going to look at them. They're blessed, I think, with having that. Uh, upbringing where you have no choice but to stand out from day one. You get very, very comfortable uh, being in your own greatness and not holding yourself back to make other people feel comfortable. And so something I've grown to be really, really grateful for, and I wouldn't change it for the world. I, I, you know, I, I think I shared with you pre-show, um, you have got this business maturity and savviness <laughs> about you that you really think, I mean, 
you communicate these things that it takes <laughs> some people, you know, decades and decades and decades to learn. But I completely agree with you. I think standing out is your superpower. At you know, at, when we're young and and we it hasn't dawned on us that it's a good thing to stick out, right? And stand out and and differentiate yourself. But once you once you have that eureka moment, which we're gonna talk more about soon, and and you embrace it, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? So true. Kind of said it better. So uh, all right. So a cattle farmer in Massachusetts, <laughs> your uncle was, is that right? Yep. <laughs> I got to tell you, I don't think I've met or heard about any <laughs> cattle farming in Massachusetts. So uh, that, that's really cool. Did you get a chance to spend some time on the farm as a kid? Yes. Yeah, so uh, growing up, it's been, I definitely had a more uh, hands-on kind of always was playing outside. That was always like my thing. So you could usually find me at nine years old, probably climbing a tree or uh, getting muddy. So plenty of scars across my body from a uh, <laughs> growing up in that kind of environment, but it was good. I think having that background, even my grandfather uh, who actually recently passed away, but he had his own business. He was an electrician. And so he had six kids. Uh, and that's what my dad's every one of those kids, you, it was like child labor I was would have been like going off because at a young age, they were like on ladders, like screwing in light bulbs and doing all that stuff. So my dad uh, grew up with that same kind of work ethic, you know, standard, uh, middle class, but really that hardworking, you know, you pull yourself up, you do the best you can, and you get that work, something so unique to that specific uh, people. Um, and so he passed that on to me. So I was definitely mowing the lawn, I would do the front yard because there were no hills. Uh, and so I was always treated kind of in that way, but it gives you one heck of a work ethic. So it's yes. been a pretty interesting childhood for sure. Yes, lots of appreciation for a hard work ethic. Um, so let's talk about your first formal job. Where, where was that? Yeah, so my first job is arguably still actually my favorite job that ever worked. I was 14 years old and I was working at Dunkin' Donuts. And it was pretty much the best way I think I could have started my career. And I'm very open to that because it's not very luxurious. And a lot of my peers didn't have to work, but I did. And I think the best thing about working at Dunkin' Donuts specifically um, was the people that you met. And I think at a pivotal age at 14, I was exposed to a very wide variety of like life paths all at once. Because when you work in fast food, you have some people that are like something that are work that are, you know, have multiple kids and they're just trying to make ends meet. And then you have some coworkers that are retirement age, like were to finish retiring. And so they're working there. Then you have some other like knuckleheads that are like, you just put up money to save up for your first car. Like they don't care about the world. And you have some people that chose not to go to college that are just trying to make a way for them. And we're all kind of people that we would have never met any in any other context like totally different and we're all just packed into a coffee shop trying to make like a caramel latte and before the line and people get mad at us and I think having that being forced to work with people in such close quarters and you would have like nothing in common with it teaches you so much I think and especially age do you want not to judge anybody because if you take the time to really hear people's stories you realize it's very easy, I think, to roll off that don't go to college or don't. And when you actually meet them and you hear your story, guys, that that's never the case. And I think society as a whole, we put labels on people so easily. But having that experience at a young age, meeting those people, I learned early on we're not all that different. And so having that gen, having that understanding um, was something that I was able to have in me. And I think even now as a leader, being in corporate America, doing these things, it's still something that I look back on and I still use those values uh, that I learned from that very first job in my everyday now. Um, so much good stuff there. We, we could spend the next couple hours just, just diving in deeper <laughs> in what you just shared. But, you know, it reminds me so, several things you shared there um, as I waited tables throughout my college career. And, you know, that's a hard job. That's a hard job. And, and un unfortunately, yeah. A big reason why it's hard is some of the people you have to wait on, right? Um, but <laughs> after true. after the end of those double shifts or after the end of that really challenging lunch where you might have made 17 bucks in tips but worked you know, your rear end off, it, it always uh, – I had this one moment of clarity where, you know, bless are those that really work hard and bust their knuckles, you know, putting yeah. in a full day's work. And and there's few things as rewarding and, and 
and as grateful that we should be of, of, of those people that, that fuel the services industries or fuel whatever it is. Right. Um, and it sounds like I also liked how you met people kind of across the um, from all walks of life and in all stages of their um, their journey. Um, so I can only imagine some of the stories, Rachel, that you could write from your time at Dunkin Donuts. You could probably write a book here today, huh? Oh, definitely. And even, I don't want to get too off topic, but even one person, uh, I just want to shout out because I actually was assigned, I had to write a My Hero essay. It was like my sophomore year of high school. And I actually wrote it about this person because when I was at Dunkin Donuts, a pizza shop that was next to us, it was like one of those two in one type buildings. Right. And his name was John and he would always come in and he would always order uh, a iced macchiato like all the time. So we knew him as like that guy that always got it. And one day we just decided to talk to him. And by the way, he was probably early thirties, like working at a pizza shop. You know, it's not the most glamour, glamorous role to him. And we were just talking about our lives. And he told me, he was like, yeah, honestly, between you and me, I used to sell drugs. I used to do this. I had the cars. I had the girls I had all this. Wow. And one day I was so deep into my addiction that I was like, I was either going to make a change or I was going to die. And he told me, he was like, that's how I got this pizza shop gig. And he was like, everyone looks at me like I'm a nobody, but they have no idea that I'm mm. on the outside. And it, it was, spoke to me because that's true heroism. Like when you can have everything and you turn it, not only are you putting it away, like it's easy to be a hero, like a fire. Well, it's not easy, but you know, we look at heroes like firefighters, nurses. It has that aspect of like, wow, like they're this like do gooder citizen. But we look at people or we look past people in fast food and things like that, where it's like that job could be them choosing drug dealing or them yeah. choosing crime and they're choosing nothing with yeah. like no from from society just because it's the right thing to do i thought yeah. he definitely changed my life that was someone i had to shut him out because i still talk about him to this day i don't know where he is now but hearing his story and his perspective changed my life for sure wow so speaking of folks that um may be consumers all of us are consumers all of us may may have looked past at some point in our own journey Folks that make up global supply chains, right? The folks that drive the trucks, that pick and pack the items, that that wait on us uh, in in retail locations, you name it. All the folks that make up global industry. So, with that said, when did you kind of have that moment of clarity where you you kind of dawned on you? There's this supply chain behind everything. When when was that for you? Yeah, I think it was when I actually probably got involved with the supply chain student association because a big part of our role is we do recruitment just because uh, a lot of the students that are coming in, they've never heard of supply chain. They don't know, like they're coming in as like marketing or finance, right? Those are usually the two uh, most popular majors because just people know them. Uh, and we had to find a way to break it down to actually explain supply chain. And kind of the way that I decided to do it is supply chain is the chain of events it takes to create a product and get it to the customer, right? Like at its very, very basic. Right. And I think when you break down like that, I think the pieces of a supply chain become a lot clearer because it's like, what are those chain of events that almost like dominoes, right? That we need to have happen. Uh, and it really made me look at it from a different perspective. You look at like a cotton t-shirt, right? You have from like cotton fields to the people who are going to process the raw materials and, you know, so on and so forth. And so that was kind of the first time I really broke it down and deeply understood it. Uh, probably that out later than I should have. I was like a junior in college, you know, <laughs> well, you know. But, uh, first time it clicks we, we, we all don't know what we don't know right and and you know I, I never toured a manufacturing facility until after i was out of college and even though my granddad retired as a machine operator from from kimberly clark and i missed that opportunity to sit down and learn firsthand from all of his experiences but you know you, you just don't know what we don't know and the, the important thing though is you had that eureka moment and gosh it was clicking and and now we're, which we're about to walk through how important it was and, and the impact it's had on your life and your journey thus far, including what's next. So with that said, so you're a senior at Howard university, iconic Howard university set to graduate in the spring, right? I uh, guess. So uh, I'll give you a well, knock on wood early, early, <laughs> you know, high five. Congrats. That is <laughs> awesome. Um, and you're going to, you're majoring in supply chain management, right? Ah, uh, Yes. Okay, so we're going to talk about the student association in a moment and, and some other things, but why why did you choose supply chain management as a major? 
Yeah, uh, so I mentioned earlier, a lot of those students that just have no idea what it is. Um, and that was actually me. My mom tried to tell me about it early on. I kind of brushed her off. You know, when you're in high school, you think you, you know everything. You know, I didn't really take her serious. So um, actually, when I got to college, I didn't even want to be in business. I actually thought I wanted to be in uh, engineering. So I have nine years robotics experience. So I started competing in a Lego league and then I moved on in high school. I competed in first robotics league. Uh, so I've competed. My team's actually been to nationals two times uh, during my high school, which was really great experience. So uh, I personally, I worked on the electronics team and uh, everyone on my team was going into engineering. It was kind of, you know, if you're a robotics nerd, you're going to you're going to go. It's like the natural <laughs> next step. Uh, you know, it's just kind of the expectation. And it wasn't until about maybe my junior or senior year, we had to do like this like aptitude test, you know, in high school where they basically say, you know, these are the majors we think would be a good fit for you based on X, Y, and Z, do the quiz. And oh gosh, yeah, I scored terribly. They were like, do not go into engineering. You're bad at math. You don't like science. It's not going to work for you. It was like, I think one of the last things, I think like law enforcement was under it and like legal. And then it was like engineering, wow. like you're like, just stay away from those things. It's not for you. Probably because of my like intense ADHD, maybe. Well, do you um, think, but, but Rachel, do you think <laughs> that, um, do you think that it was just a bad test? Do you look back on that and advice you got? Did, um, was that accurate or was it, you know, cause I, I, I gotta I got tell you when I, when I first went to college, my first couple of advisors had a big impact on my, on my collegiate time and, and really where I ended up uh, doing early in early years. And I look back at that and they didn't really know me. And we never sat <laughs> down and talked about, you know, what I like to do and where my skill sets were and my gifts and my non gifts. Um, so I've always tried to be careful when I'm and certainly with my three kids, you know, mm. you know, do you look back on that and was all that accurate? Was all that good? Honestly. So I'm an engineer right now. I'm not an engineer on my job title. I'm not an engineer on my major, but I think like an engineer, my background's an engineer because I build things. I fix things. I solve problems. But if I had majored in engineering, I was not going to pass calculus. I'm just like, I, I just know myself. And I think the test, I, I see what you're going, and I agree. I think some of those tests can be limiting. I think in my case, it did save my GPA because I think if I had actually majored in it, it would have been a problem. But um, I don't think engineering itself left me, if gotcha. that makes sense. Uh, Thinking like an engineer stays with you for sure. I love that. Uh, and secondly, <laughs> that calculus is no joke. I'm with you. It's not, it was not meant, I was not meant to be a, a, a mathematician. So I'm with you. There. <laughs> For sure. But, um, but yeah, so when I, when I got to that point, I wasn't sure what I was going to major in. So I just decided to do management because uh, it's basically, it's like the undecided of business, right? Like it's not too specific, but I don't want to be undecided and fall behind in credits. And uh, it was then our first week we have like the summit where each of the majors, it's almost like a major fair, but it's like a presentation. So the department heads will speak about it. And, you know, I heard about finance and I thought the same thing. I was afraid of the math and the technical side. Same thing with accounting. Didn't really speak to me. I was kind of interested in marketing, but I was a little bit worried about, you know, the job stability and I'm not the most artistic person. And I kind of was like, you know, not sure about like that side. Um, and so they kind of went one by one, but when they got to supply chain, it caught my eye because the department had referred to it as the engineering of business. So immediately I was like, oh, this could be something I'm interested in. And they talked about, you get to work with the engineering teams. You get to work on a lot of those projects. You guys are like this but you don't have to do any of the hard stuff, which I was like, yes. And you can make a lot more money. So that was something that I was just like immediately very intrigued by. But what really sold me was the opportunity that not the department didn't speak about it, but that I was able to identify, which was the opportunity to make the world a better place on an ethical level. And I felt that supply chain was the area of business that I could make the biggest ethical impact in our world and in corporate America out of any other major. And that's something we'll probably get into later, but that's something that's very important to me that what I'm doing is changing the world for good. And it's not just filling my pockets, but it's filling the world with that positivity uh, that we need. And so that was what really sold me was the opportunity to make a positive change, make some good money doing it and have some good job security. I think those are my three biggest selling points. And I still got to be a nerd with none of the math classes. <laughs> oh gosh, all right. Where to start? So I love what you just shared. 
And I would just, so the engineering of business, I love that phrase. I love the calling that you've identified. And I also, you know, we were talking about just earlier today on a live stream, um, you know, because supply chain and the profession and the industry, to your point, they're in a unique position to address some of the greatest challenges, new and old. And one of the cool things um, that I love about supply chain is it's, it's, it is full of doers, right? So naturally, we don't want to talk about the problems, big or small. You know, we want to, we want to address them. And, and I, I can, I get a sense from some of your answers already that you love solving problems. <laughs> so let's, so, um, gosh, so much to talk about. So little time with you, Rachel. What, <laughs> so far, what's been your favorite experience as part of the, uh, your, your time with the, uh, within the supply chain management um, program? Um, I think the best experience that I've had is really getting to work within the Supply Chain Student Association. So um, this year I'm actually getting to serve as president, but I also served as president last year, uh, which is I'm very, you know, grateful and thankful that I was voted twice. I think that's, you know, it means a lot to me. Uh, but I think getting to work on the recruitment side and helping people find a passion between what they do. I think that has to be the most rewarding. Like, I think if I wasn't in supply chain, I'd probably be in recruitment just because that's a form of service in itself, because you can get anybody prepared for a job, right? Like there's tons of certifications online. Like you can get hired with a right. strong work ethic. It's possible, but can you love what you do? Mm. Can you be passionate about what you do? And can you go home at the end of the day at work and feel proud of who you are and what you've done and being able to give that gift to someone or help like them find that uh, within themselves. That's something that I think has been the most rewarding, I think is helping people find their calling and their passion. Uh, oh. And it just happens to be supply chain. I love it. Okay. So let's go back for a second and let's just, let's level set a bit. So the student, I'm sorry, the, the Supply Chain Management Student Association, SCMSA, which fits in perfectly because we love our acronyms in supply chain. <laughs> we do. So tell us, for, tell us um, so you're, you're a two-term president, which is a feat and accomplishment, right? And you said you weren't good at the marketing side. Come on. Um, so tell us, what, what does it do? What does the group do? Definitely. So um, pretty much we have a lot of, we focus mostly on job placement um, and getting students paired with also scholarships. Uh, so we do a lot on helping companies actually come into Howard University. How do they recruit? How do we actually get them paired and getting students paired with not just a job, but a passion, a career goal. Um, so that's a huge role. Uh, but we also recruit students for the major just because unfortunately for us, being in supply chain, not a lot of people are coming in supply chain majors. So we're actually mostly transitional. So most of our students started with something else uh, and transition over. So we get a lot of students to do that. And then also we don't just leave them hanging, right? We assist them, uh, getting them adjusted, getting their coursework. Um, and newly, we actually just launched an Instagram page. So we're focusing more on that, uh, getting those resources out during different channels um, and also focusing on general body meetings. So like we have a meeting, for example, coming up with Deloitte, they're gonna be able to help come in uh, and teach our students about how to get prepared for the upcoming recruitment season. So we host a lot of those type of workshop textile events uh, as well. So really just focusing on getting students in, getting them placed with jobs, but in the, in the in-between, making sure they're actually qualified. How do we get those skills in them um, and also getting them introduced networking wise to all those amazing companies that love our supply chain students at Howard. Wow, it's like the ultimate connecting organization <laughs> with a bend toward, you know, the supply chain management profession, which is a wonderful thing. Sure. So two, two last questions on, on this, uh, your time as president. Uh, the first question is, is there one, so, so clearly you have a passion for helping others find their passion, but also helping others find resources and opportunity and whatnot. Is there one that comes to mind in, during your time as part of SCMSA um, you know, that you were able to connect, you know, an opportunity or a resource with a particular colleague or student, or you name it, that, that really said, hey, this is why I do this. Definitely. Um, that's a hard one, because I feel, well, not to toot my horn, but I feel very proud. Like, I feel like I've been able to help a lot of people. Um, so it's hard to pick. Just one. 
just one because I think it's I, I guess okay I do I can pick one because he's my mentee I have a mentee his name is uh Cameron and I actually switched him over he was international business got him converted his freshman year over to supply chain oh man and, not making a yeah. business school happy I tell you it's competing <laughs> no for sure I'm very competitive uh, I like to win but uh we were able to get him over and he actually was working for Cisco this summer so we were working in the same company uh, this past summer. And I think that was a really unique experience because I was able to see not only him come through as a student, but actually working with him. So seeing him fall in love and getting to see that. Um, and it was really good. I was able to mentor him throughout his internship and getting him excited. And he wants to work more on the people side of things. He's definitely more of a people person. And I think sometimes in supply chain, we forget that before we're numbers, before we're products and before we're parts, we are actually a human industry. And if you lose the human part, there is no strength in your supply chain. And I think for him, we were able to get him tailored. Uh, so he was actually able to work under one of my mentors with Cisco. So not only was I getting paired with the job, he's working under somebody that I know was gonna feed into him and lead into him. Uh, and he actually just made his final LinkedIn post saying about, oh, my internship ended, I love my experience. Uh, and he's looking forward to his upcoming. I think watching him grow through it was really, really positive for me, especially really up close, getting to actually work with him this summer. So that was really cool. Wow. So Cameron, if you're listening, congratulations. <laughs> and also beyond all the opportunities to be able to be mentored by you, Rachel, that's got to be quite an opportunity <laughs> based on, on uh, the homework we've done. So <laughs> second question to that, that kind of tees up perfectly because uh, my hunch is that you're very aware and deliberate about the legacy you leave on anything you touch or lead or um, are part of. So when, when, you know, after you graduate from Howard this spring and you look back on the, the imprint you've made uh, on the organization and the legacy you're leaving behind, what's one aspect of that that you'll be most proud of? Mm, that's a good question. I think one of the things I've had to learn, like, I feel like my Howard experience is divided up into like two parts. Like, I feel like in the beginning of my journey, trying to learn just how to be a leader within myself and like trying to understand, like, what does that even mean? Like, I was not in high school. I was, even though I was a robotics nerd, I wasn't a 4.0 student, right? I was not president of anything. Um, I was just there to have a good time, do the things I like to do. You know? And uh, coming into college, I never came in thinking, oh yeah, I want to be like the supply chain person, or I want to be this leader and leave this light. Like I came in, I had a 2.5 my freshman year, which I'm very open about talking about because my major GPA is almost a 4.0. Mm -hmm. um, but coming in, I really struggled. I didn't know what I was doing and I had to kind of learn, okay, I know I'm passionate about these things. I know I want to make an impact, but I know how to do it. So my first half was just figuring out what the heck, like, what does it mean to be a leader to me? What do I actually want to do? But what I learned was, none of what I did was going to matter if I didn't leave leaders behind me to mm. continue on the work. It doesn't matter how good a leader you are. And that's in business and clubs and, and anything, because if your organization can't function without you, if it depends on you, you've actually failed as a leader because a real leader creates leaders in their wake and they need to be able to function without you. And that's where I am starting my senior year, but also my junior year with my nonprofit, with uh, Supply Chain Student Association, like even being able to serve as president this year, I'm like, well, I can't serve a third term. So how do I train the people around me? How do I get them inspired? Because if I graduate and there's no other Rachel Clarks, granted, they're going to make their own legacy. Hopefully they're even better than me. But if I don't leave that in my path, everything I've done has been for nothing. And that was a really big, um, change in my mindset. And it's something that I'm completely focused on my senior year is I feel like I've made a good ways in my career. I'm very proud of the things I've done, but I'm going to be most proud if when I leave, it's able to continue on to the same quality, if not better. And if it doesn't do that, well, I don't think, I think I did something wrong. So that's where I'm at right now. Love it. Okay. <laughs> Gosh, wise beyond your years. Okay. Let's talk about uh, your uh, nonprofit that you formed. You mentioned a second ago, Waves of Change, HBCU Inc. So what does it do? Yeah, so, uh, so Waves of Change is a nonprofit organization, and it's dedicated to engaging the Black community in the environmental sustainability movement. So we do that through education, advocacy, and service. Um, and it's really been a, a passion project uh, of mine, but it's turned into something 
I think a lot more. So we actually just opened up a third chapter now. So we have a chapter at Howard University, a chapter in North Carolina A&T. We've actually just expanded to Prairie View uh, A&M down in Texas. And it's kind of at the point where it's like leaving my hands, like it's becoming its own thing. But really, even though it's an organization, we do a lot of community service work at its heart. And ironically, I was talking about how I didn't really like marketing, but maybe I do because <laughs> It's really a marketing uh, function more than anything, because our goal is to redefine the image and the brand of when you think of sustainability, because usually if you just think of environmental sustainability, and there's nothing wrong with this, but you're probably going to think of saving the turtles, don't use straws, uh, go vegan, like you're probably going to think about animals, that's like usually the first thing that comes to mind, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that, I'm all about, I mean, I don't really like turtles, but I'm all about saving the animals, right? But what my organization seeks to do is redefine that and turn environmental sustainability as a people issue and specifically as a minority issue. Because the thing is, especially in the Black community, this is something that's barely talked about, if at all. But when you look at issues like redlining or you look at issues like how Black children are more likely to not only have asthma, but die from asthma than any other race, when you look at for example, you know, tying it back to supply chain, but you look at access to fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, why is it more expensive, harder to access in certain areas when you look at quality of life, there's so many issues in the black community that stem from environmental sustainability, it's just not given that name. And when you don't put a name to it, and people don't know that they're victims of something, you can't fight it. And so that's something that we seek to do is redefining kind of what sustainability looks like, changing how it's viewed. It's more than an animal issue. It's a people issue. It's a race issue. It's a minority issue. It's a class issue. Um, and bringing in those terms and pushing that to the forefront. And then every student that we interact with that volunteers with us, granted, yes, the volunteering we do is important, right? We're picking up trash. We're doing cleanups. That's great. And it helps for the day. But the real impact is if I'm able to turn that one volunteer, turn that one day's work into a lifetime of advocacy, into a lifetime of passion, that goes a lot further than the couple pounds of trash we'll pick up. And so that's our goal is that everyone we interact with becomes aware, leaves this opportunity or whatever they're doing with us with a newfound sense of understanding, education, and a passion that they can take into their own careers, into their own communities, um, and into their own lives and families. Wonderful. That is absolutely, it, it is so needed. It is so needed in, in, in many communities, but I love how you tie it back to some of the unique challenges um, um, that certain aspects of our, of our, uh, of our country and of our society are experiencing. Um, so waves of change and congrats on the expansion third, your third chapter. I've also seen some media, media coverage of the cool things you are doing, uh, but I love, I love your why as you very distinctly uh, laid out there. So, Let's, um, we're going to kind of use this as a segue, kind of use it, what you just shared as, as a springboard, fill in the blank here. So global supply chain would be better if. Yeah, I think global supply chain would be better if it was seen as a human industry than a product in part industry. And I say that, and we've kind of brushed on that earlier, but uh, it kind of ties into everything we've talked about in the opportunity that global supply chain has for humanity, rather than just looking at part numbers and things like that. So even a great example um, for the human side of supply chain is just thinking about supply chain and sales, right? You can have the best salesperson of all time, but if our supply chain, if we don't have a good relationship with our customer and we're constantly being delays and we're not getting their product on time, it doesn't matter how good of a salesperson you are. If our supply chain doesn't also have that emphasis on report, doesn't also have that emphasis on relationship building, that lack of trust, doesn't matter how good you sell, it's going to fall apart. You're going to lose the customer. And I think sometimes we forget that just as we train our salespeople and our sales staff to be able to build reports, to be able to build those relationships, how we're able to communicate. We have to make sure that in our supply chain, as we train those people, we're instilling exactly the same values, the same emphasis, the same trainings, if not even more so. Because you can have a lackluster salesperson, but if they have a great relationship with supply chain, that can override that as well. Supply chain is really the backbone. Sales can't do anything without us. I just <laughs> wanna say that you can sell anybody anything, oh, but if they don't actually get you the product, I mean, you're out of luck. So it's got to be about the human factor in, in supply chain. I love that. Um, and, and, and it's so true. You know, it, it, even in 2021 here, the information age, the digital age, digital transformation is still, 
it is still with all the latest technology immersion it's still people that make it happen people that solve the problems people that uh get stuff moved where they need to be on time at at a certain price and as we've already spoken to that are addressing some of the biggest issues of our day um and including some that have been have been largely ignored for for quite some time so clearly your passion <laughs> Like I told everybody on the front end, the passion and the ideas and innovation and the sheer leadership, you know, it just, it oozes out of you, Rachel. <laughs> so let's talk about two, um, you, we've already touched on sustainability. Clearly that's something you're very, uh, it's really important to you and, and it's growing importance, not only to industry, but also consumers, which is a good thing, right? Because that gets us, that drives more change, right? And drives more sustainable change in sustainability, which is, is, it's kind of funny to say it like <laughs> that, but it's true. Let's talk about diversity in supply chain for a second. So um, talk about your passion for the topic and talk about, just give us some observations on, on some of the challenges you see, some of the, maybe some of the progress that's being made and then some of the areas maybe where, where we'd like to see more change. Definitely. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges when it comes to diversity in supply chain is just a lack of exposure. Um, I think that's something that you could say for uh, a lot of different areas, but actually having the understanding of what is supply chain and then also our access within specifically historically black uh, colleges and universities just to having accredited programs and programs that are resilient and robust and also making sure that some of these top supply chain companies are coming back uh, to invest because if you really want to focus on specifically, I mean, my area of expertise I'm going to be biased is going to be uh, African American recruitment just because that's what my experience is in. But really, when you look at any type of diversity in any of the numbers, you have to make sure that we're making an intentional effort to one, be able to recruit, but also to retain. And then the next step is once we have them there, avoiding and breaking those glass ceilings because you can have. For example, a big thing that uh, we talk about at Howard, but just amongst ourselves is a really big red flag when you look at a company for recruiting is if you only have diversity at the associate level. Because what that tells me is that there's a glass ceiling that I can't push past. And so that diversity, I think it has to go all the way from associate, but all the way up into the C-suite because guys, we're going to hit ceiling and what's going to happen is those are going to struggle with retention because they're going to company where we can have those advancements or even worse you get people pigeonholed and what happens is when you get into that rut you're not going to invest in your own personal development it's going to make it harder if you know you're not going to get the promotion you're not going to be putting in 100 percent of your work that's human nature that's just in general so to get the best out of your employees to get the best out of diversity and recruitment you have to make sure that there is a clear pathway that you have access two goals past that glass ceiling and that diversity doesn't just end at the associate level. Oh. Um, so that's a really big one. When I just think of it in supply chain that I know that we need to work on being to expand and challenge and grow within ourselves. Um, so sidebar, uh, <laughs> cause I want to follow up on a lot what you just shared. We've got a quite a storm coming through. And when that happens, sometimes I lose internet connectivity. So we'll keep, so if you, if I disappear, we'll, we'll reconnect <laughs> on the other side, but going back to what you shared there, I think I love how you said it, it's um, a huge red flag when there's only diversity at the associate level, you know, because we all know you look at any study, um, whether it's public, private, you name it you know, there's not uh, enough diversity in the boardrooms, right? There's not enough of uh, all voices from all walks of life in the boardroom. And, and I love, um, you know, we, we got to acknowledge that any problem before we can, we can get to work on it. Right. And so clearly um, I love kind of the conversations y'all are having um, when it comes to diversity uh, from a thought leadership standpoint, from, from, you know, what you've identified are some of the greater challenges so that we can put a, an effective action plan Right. And, and drive real change. Right. That's what it's got to come down to. Right. <laughs> True. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. All right. So um, Eureka moments, you've already kind of shared a couple of things that, I, that sounds like Eureka moments, but what else comes to mind, especially, and we haven't touched on a whole bunch of this, um, this pandemic environment that we're all fighting through. Right. Um, sure. You know, some places better than others, but we got to get a whole globe, you know, the whole global society into 
the true post-pandemic environment. But um, whether it's a eureka moment tied to the pandemic or something prior or a business uh, moment of clarity, what would be one that you haven't shared yet? Hmm. I think you gotta walk with me because it's a little weird, but uh, I had a really cool freak a moment uh, a few weeks ago. And I promise I have a life, I think outside of business, but it just happened to uh, related. But I was in my head, I was like, wow, the best training for sales or for building rapport in business must be an Uber driver. If you want to talk about having an elevator pitch or being able to make connections, right, within a short amount of time and being able to re- think an Uber is like the perfect train because I was, I was in this particular ride and I'm like, guys, awesome. Like he, we're having a great conversation. Like, I feel like I've known him for a thousand years. Like, oh my gosh, like I had to check myself, like, okay, don't trust strangers, but it was so easy to feel comfortable uh, with this person. And it made me realize, I'm like, wow, this is such an amazing training. Like if you really want to get good at building report, drive Uber for a couple months and challenge yourself to have conversations with complete strangers. And also think about the skills that it takes to read the room without turning around. Because as an Uber driver, you have to be able to tell if somebody wants to talk, if they don't want to talk, and trust that if they're not, and all you have is your rear view mirror, and you can't really look into it because you don't want to crash, right? So the skill set of being able to read the room, read energy with literally basically being blindfolded, being able to actually connect the person, and then also have an engaging conversation, knowing nothing about them and knowing you would never see them again, yet making sure they have a good time. That is like ultimate business training. And I feel like nobody talks about like how amazing that is. So I was thinking to myself, I'm like, wow, when I get a car, like I should do this. Like I should practice this. I feel like I would get real at it if I just did this just for a few months. So if anyone is listening and they try it out, definitely uh, reach out to me. I'd love to hear how it goes. Cause I was just thinking like, wow, that is like the best sales training program of all time driving Uber. I love it. You know, we're going to have to relearn how to be human. After, after we oh, get exactly. through this, uh, this period, right. And we're around each other more and, and we can get back to establishing and developing rapport in person. Cause it is, I, I agree with you. It's, it's a really, regardless if you ever go into or don't go into sales or, you know, it's, it's important when it comes to leadership, right. Just getting the buy-in of what, of, of, of your vision and, and what you believe needs to be done and getting buy-in on your, on your plan and, and you name it. So I love that. I think, I think, much like I think um, waiting tables maybe for that same time frame, four months would be good for everybody. I think being an Uber driver would be good for everybody too. So <laughs> if anyone uh, takes Rachel's advice up on that, uh, give us uh, give us a shout. Okay. So one of the final things I want to talk to you about before we make sure folks, uh, uh, we'd let folks know how to connect with you, Rachel. So your fourth internship at Cisco um, a world-renowned company. I always, you know, usually, I think it's either Fortune or Forbes, whoever puts out the most admired companies globally. Cisco is always top five. They've been, they've hit number one ranking, and that's just one of their many, um, you know, different attributes and, and awards. So you've been there, though. You've been in the mix. You've been part of the team. So what's special about Cisco, and what what have you enjoyed most about your uh, your internships? Definitely. Yeah, I, I'm super grateful uh, for the experiences that I've had with Cisco. I mean, they're Gardner uh, one supply chain in the world, I think for the second year in a row now, and they've been number one place to work, I think two years in a row or one right. year. I know they, they've always been very <laughs> nice. high up. Yeah, I think getting that experience, I think is really good because you see kind of what to do right. And I think that's valuable is getting to the kind of how the masters do it, like, hey, what's going on behind the scenes? And so I've been able to learn a lot. I think one of the things that I'm happy that I did, which um, I know a lot of people have different opinions on it, but even though I've had internships, I'm my fourth right now with Cisco, I've been in a different role every single time. I've mixed, I think you should just, you know, get four years experience in the same thing. Uh, that way you can come out, you can get into like a higher level position. But for me, it was very important that I was able to gain uh, my own personal professional development that I was able to see things from perspective, understand the supply chain. So I've moved around a lot. I've worked in planning, 
where I'm working on the customer things and that's kind of the supply chain. I've moved on the other side of worked in global supplier management where I'm not dealing with any customers. I'm dealing with suppliers. We're dealing with the silicon shortage. How do we balance that? I've worked in project management. Now I'm working in a new role again. And I've been able to dance around. But one of the things they liked about Cisco was that I even had the ability to do that in the first place. They were very accommodating with me being able to try something completely new the spaces every single Cisco intern had and something that I started out bad at things that I'm bad at give me the chance to overcome that weakness and gain some strength in it and uh, they could have easily been like you know we would prefer if you stayed you had a great planning we would love to keep you in planning but they're always very supportive very open from a point and catering to my needs for what I want professional growth and I think as a company that's something our businesses can learn from is how you invest in your staff, their growth, career dreams, their goals, you're going to build that emotional kind of equity with them. I think you get a lot, a lot of respect for allowing me to do those things. Um, and I feel very grateful. And then also you'll get people like, you always forget people do a better job when they do something that they want to do. Right. And forget that so much. Like when you just let people do what they want to do, you're fine that, wow, they'll do a great job. And I would do, of course, no matter what, that's just my work at, you know, <laughs> but um, that was something that I was excited to come to work because I knew I was going to something that I was weak with. I received the mentorship and training to gain the skills that I needed. And now when I go into my career, whether, you know, whether I'm at Cisco, whether I'm somewhere else, whether I'm working for myself, I'll be great to the training that I gained. I love the the rotational and, and how you you know you're doing different things throughout the four different internships and all the different areas. You, you become a much more well-rounded, not just leader, but also a practitioner. So you've got such a um, I mean, between your background and your leadership capacity and and uh, capabilities, and then the experiences you've gained via uh, Howard University and the program and SCMSA and, and Cisco, you're going to be a dangerous leader. Rachel, you're going to be like a, a secret weapon for some organization, or maybe a not so secret weapon, hopefully. Um, you know, I, I'm really, um, I'm blown away. Because uh, I, I think back when I was a senior in college, it was beer and pizza, you know, but you're, <laughs> you're setting a new standard and, and at a time when we need a new standard uh, in so many different ways. So Rachel, let's make sure we get you connected with any of our listeners. So what's the easiest way for folks to reach out and connect with you, Rachel? Definitely. So probably the best way to get in touch with me is LinkedIn. Uh, I know Rachel Clark, it's a pretty common name. So if you search Rachel Clark Howard or University, uh, you should be able to find me and I'll be very happy to connect. If you want to stay in touch, just shoot me a message uh, over LinkedIn. That's probably the best mode of contact. Wonderful. And we're going to make it easy. You're one click away. So if you go to the show notes this episode, you'll be able to connect uh, via the hyperlink right there, connect with Rachel Clark. You'll be able to uh, not just compare notes with her, maybe check out Waves of Change where she's Gosh, you're also an entrepreneur already. I mean, <laughs> what are you not doing, Rachel? That'd be the shorter interview, but admire that. Really appreciate it. I'm so glad we got connected and hours not, um, you know, we're just scra scraping the surface here, but we'll have to have you back, especially maybe after you graduate and, and uh, keep our finger on the pulse of all the cool things you're up to. Definitely. Thank you so much. Everybody. You bet. Rachel Clark, thanks for your time. Really have enjoyed this discussion. And again, Rachel serves as president of Howard University's Supply Chain Management Student Association, uh, founder of Waves of Change, and much, much more. So I uh, have enjoyed our time. So thanks so much, Rachel. Hey, to our listeners, hopefully you've enjoyed this inspirational, uh, informative, intriguing conversation as much as I have. Uh, be sure to check out more conversations like this at Supply Chain Now, wherever you get your podcast from, or you can learn more via our lab library at supplychainnow.com. Now, one of my favorite parts, hey, got to challenge you like we challenge our team every single day. Do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. Be just like Rachel Clark, and the world will be a lot better place. On behalf of our entire team here, Scott Luton signing off for now. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, and we'll see you right back here on Supply Chain Now real soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now.